My dearest Joe, once again I have allowed my ambition to overcome my common sense. Once again has my desire for the highest office in the land overtaken my love, my very real and deepest love for you. I am found out. Castlereagh has been made aware of my attempts to have him removed from office. He has not taken it well. This is really the limit, Canning. You are a fox. You are vanity in human form. You are a worm. You are the serpent in Eden. I am calling you out. A duel. Pistols adorned. Putney Heath. Choose your seconds wisely, for they will need to deal swiftly with your wounds. Or your corpse. He is well known as one of the finest shots in England. Whilst I, I have never fired a damn gun in my entire life. But I feel that I must accept it. Honour demands. Honour demands everything of us in the end. I would like you to try and explain this to the children as best you can, especially poor George. Poor George. Please ensure he continues to do his exercises and that he sees the good Dr Cheshire as often as can be managed. I firmly believe a miracle is just around the corner. If only you had spoken with me, it need never have come to this. We could have been friends, political allies. We think so much alike on so many issues. Well, a few. But all the same, man, to do what you did, I was in your way. That was it, wasn't it? I was an obstacle that had to be done away with. Well, now it is you who is in the way, and I will shoot you down and bundle you out of life as easily as you will have bundled me out of the cabinet. I honestly believe I will die on Putney Heath. The will is made. It is in the drawer, in the desk, by the window. You get everything. And whilst I die never having become what I believe I was destined to become, I do not die unhappy. How could I? I met you. Wonderful you. I have loved you from the moment I met you. Thank God for that house party at Walmer. Thank God that you seemed to feel the same way too. George, how could you ever doubt that? You have given me more than I ever needed and more than I ever deserved. If only I could have been a better husband, a better father, a better politician. When you speak of me to George and Harriet, Speak of me kindly. Let them remember me. As the man who did everything in his power to help his family. Not as the man who died in a duel over a petty political squabble. More than anything, I want to be remembered kindly. With affection. With love, even. Yes, with love more than anything. And if by some strange twist of fate I survive, I promise I will be a changed man. No more ambition. No more ambition centered on political power. No more intrigue. My greatest desire will be to be a family man. And my greatest act will be to walk through the park with my children at Hollycroft. All of us walking without crutches of any kind. Well, Canning, you ready? Ready. Then ten paces, turn and fire when ready. And may God have mercy on both our souls. Amen. On my mark, go. You missed, Canning. Now stand and take your punishment like a man. Be assured, I will not miss. Ah! Will he live? He'll live, but he'll be lucky to walk again with a wound like that. Will he 
live, Doctor. He will. In fact, by all appearances, he is a healthy young boy. However, there is his leg. There's a lameness, a gathering, something not quite right. I consider it the fact of him walking with any confidence, or at all, even to be very slim. He may be bedbound for the rest of his life. Oh, George, you're home, the doctor. Ah, yes, doctor. Any news? Uh, I was just talking to your wife. Yes, yes, I'm sure you were. Just get to the point. The point! Will he survive? Well, yes. Very well, then. Thank you, Doctor. But I have much to talk of with my wife. Oh, of course, but the boy's welfare... Boy's welfare be damned! I have offered my resignation. This question of Catholic emancipation will be paupers. But... Uh, thank you, Doctor. I have heard your diagnoses. My wife and I will discuss the matter and come to a decision. We will let you know our thoughts, all in the proper time. Very well. I just thought you should know, though. There really is no hope. I know. I know. Thank you, Doctor. Resigned. What else could I do? Pitt himself went first, and that's his friend and colleague. It's all the damn king's fault. What does he have against Catholics, anyway? Oh, damn them all! That may well be what he has against them. Damnation, purgatory, heresy. I doubt he's ever given a thought to theology in his life. It's sheer bloody-mindedness. Never walk again. So the doctor says. And what does he know? Is he an expert in paediatrics? Do we know any experts, well, Joan? No, we don't. George. We'll find one. By God, I'll have a son that walks if it kills me and costs me everything. I swear it. You do believe me, don't you, Joan? I believe you. Now let me put little George to bed so we can talk some more. Yes, you do that. Joan! You do know I love you, don't you? All this. This business of politics, it's all just smoke compared to what we have here. Smoke that the winds of change blow away. You're my rock, my fortress, my strong tower. Now, don't go all romantic on me, George Canning. You know very well it makes me blush. And when you blush, how can I but love you the more? Strangely similar are our fates. Young George and his father. His doctor says he will not walk. My enemies in the house say the same of me. This resignation is his end. He has fallen from grace and will not be restored. Let them say so. My son will walk. And so will I. There is no honour which is out of my reach, and there is surely a cure to be found for my son. My efforts in one direction will match my searches in the other. Together my son and I shall confound all those who say it cannot be. In time, I believe it can be so. It will be so. Totally cured. He, he is as fit as any other child their age. He can run, jump, and ride with the best of them. Uh, my wife calls it a miracle, but I prefer to think of it as the application of science. Oh, well, this uh, Dr. Cheshire you speak of, he is a genuine man of science. Oh, he is a man ahead of his time. His ideas are revolutionary. His inventions save lives. He's no charlatan. He's a genius. Oh, well. You've given me hope. Wait till I tell George. Uh, there may be one small problem. A problem? How could there possibly be a problem? You yourself said he saves lives. Indeed he does, but only in Hinkley. He refuses to travel. You must go to him, and the cure may take some time. You will have to live in Hinkley. Hinkley? A, uh... 
A uh, suburb of London, perhaps. I haven't heard of it. <laughs> it is in Leicestershire, famous for stockings and knitwear. Oh, well, then I shan't go cold. <laughs> if we must live in Leicestershire, then we must. I have visited before. I have friends in Corn. I'm sure you must know of it. I know Corn. Well, uh, just be warned. Hinkley is different. Uh, it is a place of growing industry. It is poor. It is not like London. Oh, well... What matter? I'm sure there'll be things to do there, theatres, dances, societies. George will make new friends. I will persuade my husband we must move, and we can keep the house here should we ever need it. I'm sure we will grow to love Hinkley. Ah, well then you will prove a better person than I, Joan. But I must be away. Glad to have been of help. If you need any more, you know where we are. Numbers they are. Look, look at you as if you're no more than muck on their shoe. Though, the girl's nice. I've got two boys. One of them needs a chair. To be real about it, he's dead pasty. Not one for this world, I think. Generous, though. I mean, when I brought him in the hot water, the bloke gave me a penny. A whole penny for just bringing in a jug of water. They're rolling in money, the lot of them. So why the stain at the inn? I mean, no offence, but. It's no better than a pigsty. There's nowhere else to go, is there? Not unless you want to stay up in Bosworth. They need to be near some doctor in town. That's Dr Cheshire. He's killed off his leg when he done it in. Very good man. Very good looking. What? Even better looking than me? Everyone's better looking than you, Tom, so... That's no test. <laughs> Dreaming again. Dreaming again, Peggy Taylor. You'll never learn. The likes of us never rise above the gutter. It's where we're born, where we'll die. And for some, it's where we'll marry and have our kids. I don't dream of wedding Dr Cheshire. He has a wife. She's kind and good. My mum does the laundry. It's just saying, that's all. But I do dream. I dream of leaving this place. You just wait and see, it's London for me. Maybe Leicester. Don't mind as long as I can move. Did you call me out, please, before? Because if you did... No, she didn't. So don't get guessing all high and mighty. Those work you're doing. Those slot buckets aren't going to clean themselves. But they sting. No worse than you do. So if you want your job here, go on with it. Go on, go. Poor Tom. Who? He reckons he'll marry you one day. Yeah, well, better manage that temper first. I'm not marrying anyone who uses his fist before he uses his brain. I've seen the bruises, Lily. Yeah, well, that's what dads are like, aren't they? The way of the world. So tell me, sir, how did this lameness come about? It was all my fault. It was both our fault. We had gone away, both of us. Left the child in the care of servants. He had been ill. Uh, from birth he had a defect, a gathering in his legs. But he had overcome this. He had learned to walk. And yet he became sickly again. For a while we feared consumption. But he seems to be getting better. So we left him. It was summer and there was a loveliness in the London parks. He went for a walk with a nursemaid. But he slipped. Probably playing the fool as usual. He slipped. Fell down hard. Hit a tree. The nurse said there was a crack. Poor little chap. Lay as if he were dead. But he wasn't dead. He was lame. He couldn't walk at all. He had to be carried home. I see. And you expect me to restore him to health? Well, I must say I fail as often as I succeed in such instances. I can make no promises. We had such plans for him. My husband is a very ambitious man. So I read. Well, less so now. Now I only want him to know what it means to be happy once again. And then maybe, one day, 
He can become a clergyman. George, you can't possibly mean that. Well, it's probably all he'd be fit for. I am right, aren't I, Doctor? Well, I couldn't possibly say, sir, but clergyman is a very fine profession. Well, I have friends that preach. Some are even Catholic. Oh, dear. Uh, ignore her, Doctor. She thinks like the King. Me, I have no time for religion. They all worship the same God. Why the hell can't they all get along? Indeed. Now, to the little boy. Are you happy for him to come to Hinkley? We are. We have booked rooms at the inn. In time, we'll find a house. The inn? Oh dear. Well, the sooner you can move, the better. What do you mean? You'll soon find out. No meat for supper? What on earth do you mean, no meat? We pay you so we can eat meat. We pay your father well. Why he hasn't come up here to explain this to me himself, but has instead sent you, I do not know. Cowardly, I call it. Very sorry, sir, but Pa's indisposed at the moment and... Junk, you mean? I couldn't say, sir. But, sir, the fact is the butcher's out meat for the weekend. We, we've got plenty of bread and beer. Bread and beer? Dear God! I am come to the vilest inn in the nastiest town in the direst county that imagination can conceive! Can you deny that? I might be able to if I knew what you were saying. The lot of fancy word in that sentence. Too many for me. Oh, get out, both of you. And you, feed the fire and get the landlord up here to see me as soon as he's sober. Yes, sir. But, sir? We've run out cold. We simply must get out of here just as soon as we can. Oh, Doctor, is there any way you can recommend? Oh, well, there's Burbage, of course, but the house is very hard to come by. Money is no object. Oh, of course. I'm sure I could ask around and find you a place. It would probably come with whitewashed walls and a thousand other inconveniences, but, well, it'd be a paradise compared to the inn. Well, if you could. And little George? No, I'm working on a design. It's revolutionary in concept, and if I succeed, it will... Well, we shall see. Bring him to me just as soon as you can. So, your grandma was an actress? How wonderful. Did you ever get to see her? There's one up in town, but it's no good for the likes of us. You could go with me if you like. Yes, I'm sure my mum wouldn't mind. Really? And there'd be singing and dancing and romance. Unless it's Shakespeare. Shakespeare is really rather grand, Peggy. <clears throat> I'm there's sure you'd love it. There's the fire for you, Master Georgian. Keep you warm. And we've sent for some buns, the ones you like. Probably the last to be allowed to eat for quite some time. Me and putting a diet by the doctor. Not to eat too much cake. It's cheese and vegetables for me. Oh, not even fruit? Oh, I expect I'll be allowed to eat fruit, but no pies. Oh, but I've bought some pies for Melton especially. Oh, good. And they can all be for me. Morning, George. Still here, I see. You, go! Move my brother's chair out of the way of the fire, I'm freezing. But the doctor says his George is supposed to keep warm. And where is the good doctor? And by what right do you call my brother George? It was me. Is that any way to address your betters? I said it was all right to call me George. Peggy's my friend. Impossible. When Mother hears of this, she will forbid it. Fine. Not only you will move him out of the way. Now look what you've done! I will not be spoken to like that by a servant girl! I will have you flogged for this. You, boy! Pick the little weed up and put it back in his chair. Or not. Shouldn't treat people the way he treats you? Or William. He believes Mama and Papa love Harry to myself more than him. He's quite jealous. Of course, it may be true. My father seems so distracted with his job and 
Mama seems to spend all of her time with me. Perhaps he's forgotten. It's really rather sad when you think about it. That's still no reason for him to be such a monster. He's not a monster, Peggy. Am I getting him? There's some love, some friends, and his life could be transformed. Never mind, Hans. Well, we best be going. Work to be done. Will you be okay? Oh, I have a book. And Harry just coming later, later to tell me about her walk. She's been on a history walk with Mama. And they've gone in search of a, a Roman road. You won't forget about the place for me, George? No. I won't forget. I can't make any promises. a show for Mama and Papa. What a splendid idea. We could have costumes and props and I could be the hero. And you, Peggy, could be the princess. Now, off you go. I must think. The situation with Napoleon is becoming great. Mm. The waywardness of the Russians is a disgrace. Have we no friends in Europe? Apparently not. We are isolated and vulnerable. We are hated. Our arrogance and isolationism comes with a price. Are we prepared to pay? Denmark, do you mean? Denmark, absolutely. They refuse all our attempts at diplomacy. It is as if they are daring us to invade, knowing all the while we would do no such thing. We would not invade? No, it would be a disaster. The public have grown tired of war, and the opposition would have none of it. It would be political suicide. If it went wrong. But if we were to succeed and gain their navy, we would gain precious time and advantage. Would you dare? I dare anything. I defy any man to oppose it. It is the only way. Many will die. You will lose many friends. It could end your career. Or make it. This country needs strong and stable leadership. It needs someone who sees what needs to be done and does it. There is no place for ideology or artifice. Action is what is needed. A statesman who is unprepared to act is nothing more than a poor player upon the stage whose words and deeds have little consequence when the curtain falls. I say we blockade Copenhagen and force the Danes to do what we want. And I say we must act quickly before Napoleon can cross us. You're a hard man, George Canning, and I pity anyone who crosses you. I hope you do fulfill your ambition. You could well have the makings of the greatest prime minister this country has ever known. I spared your life. It's a wound to the thigh. You won't die. I might be lame. I pray that is the case. Maybe then you'll stop acting as if you are the emperor of the world. If I have restricted you in any way, I consider myself to have done my country a great favour. But we used to be such friends, you and I. What changed? You did, George. Your ambition has made you mad. You lost your compassion, your empathy, your grace. And with them you have lost your soul. You are a selfish monster. I pray you will not rise again. Look at it this way, George. Perhaps now you'll finally understand how your son feels, abandoned as he is in Leicestershire. Maybe now you'll go for walks together and get to know one another as a father should. Goodbye, George.
Dad said he expected me to be doing 200 yards by the end of the week. 200 yards. I can't do that, Harriet. Not yet, anyway, but you will. Now that Dr. Treasure has your measure, he'll fix the calipers, and you'll be running before you know it. Imagine that. I'd love to run. What's it like, Harriet? <laughs> well, I wouldn't know. Girls aren't supposed to run. Your heart beats so fast that you think it will burst, and then the wind it grabs your hair in its fist and it pulls, and then your eyes water, and your mouth dries, and your legs, they feel like pistons, and you just push and push, so you just go faster and faster, and then you stop, and you collapse, and your face goes redder than a beetroot, but you run, you feel as though you could be sick at any moment, but you run, and you feel alive, it's just best feeling ever. Why do you run, baby? Let's get away from here. We're in a castle street, across the fields where the sun still shines and birds sing, you can feel warm. No one hits you or hurts you. Who hits you? Damn them. Traders in the street. Other kids. I'm alive with bruises. Anyway, George, you're walking, and that's only running in slow motion, so that's good. I'll run one day, Peggy. Maybe you'll give me a race. I maybe. Maybe I will. Moustache. I need to go get some milk for my mum. I'm going to play with the fire, so move for it again. That girl is the most amazing person I know. Present company accepted, of course. Of course. Oh, look. Here comes William. He looks so stern. I wish he would grow up so quickly. George? You'll catch your death of cold out here. Harriet, what were you thinking? I was practicing in my calipers. Father says... Oh, poo what Father says. He's in London, not here. He has no idea how cold this evil little town is. If you catch a cold... That's just one more worry for Mother. How could you be so selfish? Sorry, William. I just so wanted to walk outside. Oh, well, you're an invalid, George. And invalids don't go outside. You'll always be an invalid. And the sooner you get to accepting that, the sooner you'll avoid disappointment. No, George. Some days I think it would have been better for all of us if you had died that day at the park. Who knows? The tragedy could have increased Father's popularity. He could be Prime Minister by now. Oh, William, well, you know, how can you say such a thing? My mum and Papa love George very much. Oh, I know they do. With so much love, they have no more room for me. One day, one day soon, George, you'll be dead. And I'll be reinstated as favourite. Now come inside. And be quick about it! Some days I really hate my brother. <clears throat> Some days? I actually quite like him. Not today. Come on. You can try and sneak out later. I said I'd be Peggy by the way. Well, Joan, this is splendid. Much better than those drab rooms. Oh, much better than that inn. Ah, the inn. Vile as it was, <clears throat> it taught me much about the common folk of England and what needs to be done to make them better people. Oh, really? And what does need to be done? We need to teach them to take greater pride in their appearance. To have ambition, to seek all ways to better themselves. Would it not be better yet to just teach them? Teach them English, mathematics, science and theology? After all, people without education will always remain ignorant. Without education there is no hope. Without hope, no ambition. 
Free schools for all and not just the moneyed classes. My God! What a ridiculous proposition! <laughs> You're sounding like those fools, the bishops, that want to build their own poor schools. No, no. Education will just ruin the working classes. They have their place. But learning will just make them unhappy. If you believe that, then you really did learn nothing from our stay at the inn. Did you ever talk to the children, George? Did you ever learn how they really lived? I was always happy to pass time with them. Yes, but did you ever talk to them? And by talk to them, I mean, did you ever truly listen to what they had to say? Of course I listened. I'm a politician. We're paid to listen. No, you are paid to govern. Quite honestly, I don't think you know how to listen. You hear words, but you don't weigh them. And people speak, but their thoughts don't count. You have been like it all your life. That's what gets you into trouble. You think there should be one voice, one vision. Of course. It's only common sense. Yes, but you think that voice and that vision should be yours. You really are insufferable, George, and yet you are so transparent that I cannot think ill of you. Really. You need to see the future of England. I know that's what matters. You are a patriot. Oh, indeed. I like to think so. You are, George. You truly are. But you could be a better one if you discovered the real England. Hickley is England, George. This is where English men and women work and strive to push this country forward. It is here that progress is made, not in London, but in Hinkley and in towns like it, where men and women grow, they create, they invent. You should meet them and discover that for yourself. Well, there's Cheshire. Yes, a doctor who you think of as a man almost your equal. But there are others. There's Charlie, the gardener, Peggy, the cook, an innkeeper. Peggy? What on earth has she to do with any of this? A girl with no education, no skills, and no future. Peggy is good. She is kind. She is bright. She may not be contributing to the economy, and the little I pay her to help out here barely keeps her fed. But she makes the world a little brighter just by being in it. Isn't that worth something? I think it is. Peggy is kind, she is well-mannered, and she makes George happy. She brings him hope. And if there's anything Peggy is rich in, it is that. Hope. But she's nobody. Nothing. Oh, you're talking rot, Joan. No, you don't understand. Uh, this is a man's world, and it takes a man to understand it. This is our world, George. With men and women. And quite frankly, I think the men are making an unholy mess of it all. Why, I just have to think of you in Denmark. Napoleon. Is the world a safer place because of what you did? Or has it just become a little more dangerous? Take a good, long look at our world, George, and see if I'm not right. Peggy is good, and if the world were filled with more people like her, it would be a richer place for it. And a poorer one. But only in money. And isn't that what matters? Not to me. Look. The children are having a play this evening and they want us to watch it. Watch it with me, George, and see what it is I'm trying to tell you. I don't have time, letters, papers, you know the sort of thing. Yes, all too well. But this play is for one night. And if you miss it, then you shall never have the chance again. Very well. As you put it like that, I will watch. Good. And Dr Cheshire will be there. So you can have some male company, even if he is not quite your equal. <clears throat> the gallopers are working well with young George. He can walk long distances unaided. Well, he's not fast, but his speed improves almost daily. And yet... He is still unwell. It's not just the fall. There is something rotten within him. I fear he may be dying. Have you told his family? No, I, I can't. They are so overjoyed with what progress we have made. Well, his father is so convinced he is well. He is taken to spending longer and longer periods in London. But he's forgetting his promises. Now, he's a politician, it's in his blood. But the boy, surely he must have seen. The boy himself, he knows. But he smiles less. He no longer talks about tomorrow as if it was a place he could reach. 
He is a brave soul. And his friends. Well, they're everything to him. More support than that monster of a brother. <laughs> Our own little Caliban. William made monstrous by Prospero's neglect. And to think, this man would one day be Prime Minister. Well, heaven help us if he runs the country the way he runs his family. I am invited to the house tonight to watch a play, a presentation by the children. Well, that would be nice. Yes, for the children. All the while, George and I will play the hypocrite and, and feign pleasure at each other's company whilst all the while despising one another. Robert! Or maybe not despising. But I cannot like a man for whom I have no respect. I know that. But for the sake of our practice, all you've worked for, you must... Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight as we bring you the incredible story of the man known as Robinson Crusoe. Right then, chap. It's okay, really. That's part of the play. Oh. Robinson Crusoe was a passenger on a ship, got caught in a storm. The storm was so bad, it flooded the masts, causing the ship to sink. All hands were lost but one, Crusoe. And after what seemed like days of clinging on to the wrecked spars of the ship, he was washed ashore. I am saved! Try land at last. I will build shelter, find food and water, and make a fire as a signal, and in a few days, some passing ship will come and rescue me. <laughs> He'll be lucky. Well, it stands to reason. <laughs> Not much of a realist, this Crusoe, that's for sure. Just a minute. What's this I see? Footprints. And I'm not alone. So are they friend or are they foe? I must be careful. I will lie in wait until you come by this way. Uh, George, your hair is rather messy, darling. Mother, it's supposed to look messy. I've been washed up by the sea. I see. Ah, well, who's this? I spy the man from my lookout tower. Who is he? What can he want? Will he be my friend? Ho there! I am that man. My ship was wrecked and I landed here. Do you speak English? <laughs> Not very well. He's from Hinkley. <laughs> I do speak English. I landed off the owner of a ship I sailed. I was a slave. Well, here we are all equals. I will have no slaves on my island. Then we must go. Pirates have made these beaches. Pirates? Oh no. What will they do if they catch us? They'll make us walk the plank. They'll kill all us. They'll hang us by a yard arm. All other manners of devilish torture. And then let us go. But slow. I fear I have lost the use of my legs in the wreckage. I must help thee. Here, lean on me. Well, it's certainly not a thrill a minute, is it? Oh, darling, I think it's very good. Very moving. Moving? Oh, I wish they would. But well, why the devil couldn't he wear his calipers? Uh, they probably would have got in the way of the action. Action? Well... <laughs> Eventually, they found their way to a hut, which was built by a former slave who Crusoe called Friday, with that being the day that they had met. C Friday had a real name, but Crusoe was proved unable to say it, with it being foreign. Not wrong there. Some of these foreign names are damned difficult. Why they can't all just be Smith and Jones, I don't know. George, you are not funny. Look, here comes William and Harriet. Aha! I am the Pirate King, black-hearted Jake. And I have come to this island to gain fruit, fresh water, and reclaim my treasure. Treasure! I take no nonsense from my men. And those who question my orders soon find themselves dead. Dead! Now, dig here, for according to me map, this is the exact spot where we buried the chest of gold doubloons. Doubloons! And would you stop repeating everything I say? It's dashed annoying! That's enough, William. It's okay, Mother, it's in the script and it didn't hurt. Well, not much, anyway. Oh, well, carry on, dear. You are very good. Most convincing! <laughs> well, dig, you worm! Uh, at last, my pirate king, there is no chest here. Art thou sure? Zounds and eggers, you're right. You know what this means. 
Or we go home empty handed. No. It means there are others on the island. Spies! That have watched us come and go. And have stolen our treasure. And you know what I does with spies. No, not really. What? I slit their gizzards and spill their innards on the sand for the crabs to eat. Oh, Will, that's disgusting. That's not in the script. No matter. Because it's what I'll do when I catches them. Ahar! It's very good, that old one. A fine actor. Uh, he's not acting. That's just how he is. <laughs> A bloody monster. Ah, here's Peggy. Come to explain the holes in the plot. <laughs> Crusoe and Friday soon landed their danger and realised that they had to fight the fearsome pirates. This fight was won to the death. I win! That makes me the new pirate king. Does it not? I suppose so. And we can sail home with the treasure. And you, Friday, can join me. We are rich! I think you mean I'm rich. I, I did find you. I rescued you and I saved you. Oh. Very well then. But perhaps I could have a little. Seeing as I am the new pirate king. <laughs> that seems fair. All right then. No, no, can't have this. Can't have a slave dictating the terms. An ex-slave, dear. No such thing as an ex-slave. No, 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 no. The money is George's by right of conquest. That's the way it works. For you, perhaps, but not for our children. And they lived happily ever after. And Crusoe became a pirate who scourged the seven seas. And Friday, he bought his own country and settled down with a wife where he had hundreds of children. The end. And now, Lily will serve your own homemade pirate cocktail. Ah, George, George. George, that's all right, he's probably just overexcited. By God, he's running a fever, he needs to get to bed now. Is he going to be all right? I, I don't know, I just don't know. I think it's consumption. After all he suffered, poor lad. W will they need to take him away? Should he be in hospital? Perhaps. I doubt anything will help, truth be told. But maybe it'd be better for him to be someplace else. Somewhere warm. Well, matter with the end of your little experiment. An end, yes. But I've learned all I need know. I just wish I could have made a difference. You did make a difference. You made him walk again. With crutches. Aye. That's something, I suppose. Well, George, how is life in the provinces suiting you? Hinkley, is it? Uh, Burbage. Uh, Hinkley is nearby. <laughs> Ever the snob, eh, George? I know the place. Hunted near there. Nice country. Nice country. God-awful town. Full of crooks and swindlers. Beggars and thieves. Really? That's not what Joan says. You've spoken with Joan? Oh, my wife has, leastways. Joan seems to think the place has its redeeming qualities, and the children seem happy. I will give you that. Even William, for all his awkwardness, seems to have found something there. I hear young George is doing very well, this marvellous doctor. He was. The doctor has worked miracles. He is a doctor who can work wonders with the skeleton. But... But? There is more to George's illness than just his crippled body. There is a corruption within him, eating at his heart. Dr. Cheshire fears for his life. I'm sorry to hear that, George. Do you need more time at home with the family? I was going to offer you... No, no, not at all. I am always willing to serve. No matter the cost? I will not serve at a cost to my family. But they understand that if my ambitions are fruitful, then life will be immeasurably better for them all. If I succeed, we all succeed. Admirable. You mentioned an offer. Yes, but now that we've spoken, I think I've changed my mind. 
I, I think I might be in a position to help you and George at the present time. How do you like the sound of ambassador to Portugal? Portugal? I... I had thought the Board of Control... Oh, or... later. Later, perhaps. Portugal! It's warm, the climate will suit little George, and I can think of no one who will serve Britain's interests better than you. Are you a fine patriot, one who I trust completely? Will you take the role? Portugal? But it's full of pirates! And who better to fight them? But I don't speak Portuguese! You'll learn! And besides, you're the British ambassador. They won't expect you to. Will you take the role? I would leave England. How long? Oh, I don't imagine it'll be for long. Two years, perhaps? Two years? Long enough to be forgotten. Or make my mark. Very well. I will tell Joan. We will leave Hinkley and hope for better things for my son in a warmer climate. That's it, George. And when I return... We shall see. I know how high you hope for. One day, perhaps, George. One day. Thank you. Yes, I understand. Thank you, Prime Minister. You heard the news? The cannings are leaving. Portugal. Portugal? Well, that's a bit far to go. But when you said they need to be somewhere warmer, I thought you meant Cornwall. George is to be British ambassador. Funny choice of man, really. Diplomacy isn't George's strong point. Perhaps that's why he was chosen. The Prime Minister wants to bring about order. Show those foreigners just who's in charge. Well, if that is the plan, it could backfire most spectacularly. But it will be good for the children. It may even help little George. It may help. In truth, I doubt it. It may extend his years. He may live a little longer, but his days are short. They will lose him before he attains a majority. Mark my words. He's such a nice boy. I think Peggy's fallen for him. Peggy? Oh, I can believe it. But even if he had have lived, this isn't a good news story for anyone. No. And yet he was happy here. Happy? Aye. Aye, there is that. I wonder how many of us could say that. Are you not happy? <clears throat> no. I doubt that I am. I'm not unhappy. I am content with my life. I have a good job, good home, a wonderful wife. But my patients die. And my inventions fail. I, I cannot be trusted with those that are given to my care. You save some. Yeah, I some. And whilst it is only some, I shall not be happy. I cannot be happy until I can save them all. You cannot hold back death. No much as I would like. Maybe to choose the path of a doctor is to choose the path of disappointment. Oh, you are melancholy tonight. Go to bed. Tomorrow the sun will rise and you'll feel differently. Of course. Thank you, my dear. I do hope I've not upset you in any way. No. No. Now go. I'll be up in a moment. I must write to Joe. Dear Joan, I am truly sorry to hear that you will be leaving us. I have so much enjoyed having you as a friend these past few years. I know that you were always amused at how well, in awe I was of you at first. But you took me past that. So that now you've become almost like a sister to me. I'm sure that you will not be sorry to leave, Hinkley. I often wonder why Robert insists on staying here. He has an unnatural love for the town. I suspect it's his fear of failure. It's so great he cannot contemplate failing in a place such as London, but to fail in Hinkley might just be bearable. I am sorry that he has failed your son. He has tried all he knows, but that just wasn't enough. He tells me he will have a much better chance in Portugal. So 
so I hope, for if you have the time, that you will deign to write to me and keep me updated as to his well-being. We have all grown so fond of him. Remember us with the affection that we will remember our times with you. I will treasure our conversations in my heart with love, Effie Cheshire. That woman. What is to become of her now I am to leave her? She will grow old in obscurity along with her husband. She was good, she was kind, well-mannered. But I doubt I shall write to her. No, I shan't write. It's time to put Hinkley behind me now. Its day is done. I was sure they'd come. Sure. Father told them not to. Very sensible. There's no place for maudlin sentimentality. That's a phrase father uses. Are you sure you know what it means? It means he doesn't want a lot of crying children blocking the hallway. No. I don't suppose he does. Well. It doesn't really matter what Daddy wants to say. Because they've come anyway. Oh, well, in that case, I'm going. I'll wait outside by the carriage. And George, do not take the day. Goodbye, be done with it. Goodbye and good riddance. Well, I shan't be long, will you? I came to wish you luck. And bon voyage. You'll be glad to be rid of Inkley, won't you? I wish I was coming with you. I'd love to visit a foreign land, somewhere warm with sunshine. Do you think you will come back? Mm, I expect so. And not to Inkley? I don't think so. So, this really is goodbye then? Yes, I'm afraid so. George, I want you to say something. I'm sorry too. I will write. I promise. You can write, of course, but we can't read much. Dr. Cheshire promised he'd teach me. I hoped you would. I expected you'd forget in the end. I could never forget. I promise that as long as I live, I'll never forget. Alright. Well, we best be going. I'll wait to be down. There's always work to be done. I'll show you out. You're going. I can't bear the thought. If I turn away now, I'll never see you again. You'll see me again. You will. You'll return to London. And then come and see me in London. I can't do that. Me in London. There's laugh and no mistake. I'd stick out like a sore thumb. You'd shine like a star. You've taught me so much, Peggy. Brought me so much. You do know I love you, don't you? You can't do. Not someone like you and someone like me. That would never do. I don't care what does or does not do. I love you, Peggy. And I'm sorry it's taken so long to tell you. But tell me you feel the same. I can go away happy. I do love thee, little George Canning. So much my heart will burst, but going so my heart will break. Just promise me you won't forget me. Promise me you won't go marry Tom before I die. You'll not die, George. Not in Portugal. Not ever. Maybe not. Do you promise? I promise. I'll kiss you before I go. George, time to go. I have to go, Peggy. Until we meet in London. is hot and the air is dry and it feels as though all my disease is being burned away. I believe I'm getting better. 
I'm still using my cal calipers and have walked down to the sea on a number of occasions. The sea is so very beautiful. Harriet sends her love. William has nothing good to say. Spends a lot of his time killing rats with a sword. Father's very busy. And we always have guests. But never any children. There is no one like you here, Peggy. And so, well, it is a beautiful place. I'd swap you for Hinkley any day. If it meant I could see you again. Father says we will be here for a few years. Then he will come back to London. He says he will be Prime Minister one day. I doubt it, but he has his dreams. Give my love to Tom and Lily. Say hello to Dr. Cheshire. Write soon. George. P.S. I still feel the same. Can you believe it? That idiot Canning has been offered the Board of Control. We will share the front bench once more. I hope this doesn't mean you'll be fighting another duel. If it does, I will do my utmost to bring it to a more satisfactory conclusion. When I think of all the mistakes and inconveniences I could have avoided if we'd finished it all those years ago. I hope you're joking. You need to work together from that one. As colleagues, if not as friends. <laughs> And it would be lovely to have Joe back, and the rest. I should invite them over as soon as they arrive home. Are you mad? I wouldn't want that man in my house. Oh no, I, I agree, that wouldn't do. But the rest really are rather lovely. Oh, we will have so much fun. Yeah. Oh, she wants no. He was locked away in Portugal. I stood a chance with Peggy. <laughs> now he's back. Sure, she stayed in Portugal. Sure, she will kill him. I hope it does. All she ever thinks about is George. Never has a thought for me. He's a ruddy cripple for crying out loud. What use is it to anyone? If she hears you talking like that, Tom, you're loose for good. Just wait. It's all awesome, just wait. Well, it is very good of you to come all this way. It's my pleasure. We have so many other doctors here that are more... more... Well, it is very good of you to come all this way. Well, it's my pleasure. But you have so many other doctors that are more qualified than I am. I know, but you knew him best of all, Robert. I... I told him you were coming. I just want to see if I can still hope. He might not like what I have to say. I know, but I trust your judgment and I will take your counsel. Where is he? In his chair. I let him know you were here. He got quite excited. He asked if you brought Peggy. I told him. I did. I did bring her. But she insisted. Besides, it might do him some good. Well, you may be right. He talks of her so often. But he is just a boy, and you know what they're like. I do, but George is no ordinary boy. I will have a look at him and give you my honest opinion for what it's worth. Thank you. Peggy, you came. The doctor said I'd be good for you, like a tonic. You don't look well, George. I am not well, Peggy. And now you are here. What did the doctor say? To me? Nothing. To Mama. I'm sure that in their whispers, they tell her that I have not long left to live. That she should prepare herself. 
George, you should have stayed in Portugal. Father needs you to come home. He's back in the cabinet. Well, damn your father and his ambition. Please, Peggy. If father becomes prime minister, I shall be very proud. Does he love you, do you think? I know he loves me. He'll break his heart when I die. I can't bear to think of him and Mama suffering like that. Well, he has a queer way of showing them, I say. I know. Forgive him that, will you? I'd love you to be friends. You know, in Portugal, I dreamed that one day I'd be well enough to marry you. I had that dream too. It was my favourite dream. It's a pity. You can't. Doctor! Doctor! Will he live, Doctor? Will he live? There's nothing more to do, my lord. It's just a matter of time. I knew that day in London it was only a matter of weeks. Peggy will be devastated. Will you go and tell her? No. Uh, Joan herself has said that she will write separately. I think in time she came to recognise. Well, that's something, I suppose. Do you think this will mean he'll give up politics? Well, a blow like that can stop a man in his tracks. No, I doubt it. I doubt it very much. Dr. Cheshire! You've heard? I yes. I've heard. He's gone to a better place. A place where his lungs can fill with sweet air and his legs will pump like pistons and he'll run and not grow weary. He's in a better place. But I'm not. What is there left for me now? Oh, now, Peggy. It's not the end of the world. You're young yet. You're healed and when you do... I'll marry Tom. Is that what you're saying? Well, I shan't. I shan't come. What you need is a good cry. We all do. I suspect we'll be going to the funeral. I doubt it. My little George has died and, and so have all our ties that we had with that family. It's time for us all to move on. We won't forget him, Peggy. But we can't stay with him. Life goes on. And so must we with it. Is it as expected? It is. The king has buried his objections to a pro-Catholic minister and invited Cannon to form a new government. But who will serve under him? Not you. Not Wellington. It will have to be a coalition. It will never last. Well, he is a remarkable man. He inspires loyalty and love in many. And enmity and hate in others. He is clever, but he's a dangerous man. He's driven by prejudice and ambition. I fear for our country under his rule. He is impetuous and flawed. He could lose everything by overplaying his hand. He is not a man to entrust with the peace of the world. And yet, that is precisely what has happened. Can we, do? we can pray that he will not last. He will cling to power till the very end. That end may not be long in coming. Dark days lie ahead for all of us, my dear Wilberforce. We must pray for a new dawn to come soon. You have been invited to the Duke of York's funeral in Windsor. Will you go? Yes, of course I'll go. It would damage my ambition greatly if I were not to be seen there. Besides, he was a good man. George, 
It is January, and that chapel is so cold, and you have not been well. You are old. Older, maybe, but not old. I would wear an extra layer beneath my dress. Will that do? Well, it won't satisfy me completely. I worry. I worry so much. Joan, still so loving after all these years. <laughs> after all my indiscretions, my faults, our loss. My love for you has neither diminished nor dimmed. I couldn't bear to lose you. He has taken to his bed, they say. The end is near. It was the funeral that started it. He should never have gone. But his ambition drove him to attend, and now he pays the price. He's been ill for some, quite some time, but his drive would not let him succumb. His pride, rather. I may not have liked the man, but I never doubted his love for England. He had a great heart. Well, let history be his judge. I hated his politics, but like the man. To see him around his family, he was a very different creature altogether. He will be much missed. Still, thank heavens he only served three months. Much longer, and who knows what mistakes he might have made. Indeed, 119 days. He has won his own unique place in history, but not one that he would have wanted. I will pray for him and his wife. It's all they have left. to me from the prayer book. Oh, Father, are you strong now? <laughs> it will strengthen my spirit for what is to come. George, don't talk like that. <laughs> don't you think I know I'm dying? The whispers of doctors tell me all I need to know. <laughs> I'll have no denying it. Let Harriet pray. And then perhaps some final words for England. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on your servant. From all evil, from all sin, from all tribulation, good Lord, deliver us. By your holy incarnation, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, good Lord, deliver us. By your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, good Lord, deliver us. We, we sinners beseech you to hear us, Lord Christ, that it may please you to deliver the soul of your servant from the power of evil and from eternal death. We beseech you to do That it may please you mercifully to pardon all his sins. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, that it may please you to grant him a place of refreshment, <coughs> an everlasting blessedness. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, and it may please you to give joy and gladness in your kingdom, with your saints in light. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. I thank you, my dear. I thought to say some words for England, but I feel I must talk to Joan. I am here, George. Message for the King. Tell him the First Minister of England is dead.
And how far can you walk now? Ever so far. And you never tire? Never. It's the best feeling in the world. And you, Father? I am content. You've achieved so much. <laughs> I am content because I have seen you walk without crutches. That simple joy outweighs everything else. Good. So, what now? Let us walk a while. Or perhaps run. Very well. A race it is. Ah. <laughs> Ready. Steady. Get, Get the mark! <laughs>